You know, everyone has a tongue, and you often ask, wonder, you know, what's worldly about a tongue? Well, worldliness of the tongue is created by misusing the tongue. We ought to use our tongue to glorify God, but sometimes we use it against other people. Being a Christian affects the way that one talks. Or at least it should affect the way one talks. I said I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Psalms 39 verse 1. Guard your mouth. Restrain your speech because you can sin with your mouth. And it can cost you your eternal soul. So you need to pay attention to what you use your mouth for. Many people misuse the tongue. And there are many ways in which you can misuse the tongue. By lying, cursing, casual oaths, angry words, gossip, flattery, grumbling, complaining, there are many ways in which you can misuse your tongue. You know, as Christians, we must obey the rules and concerns controlling our tongue. But what about angry words and gossip? They're important. How we misuse our tongue in dealing with one another can be a very sinful attribute uh, to our conduct. It can cost us our eternal soul. So it's very important that we listen and understand what misuse of the tongue is. Your tongue is a danger to yourself and to others. It is never, ever fully tamed. James tells us in James 3 verse 8 that no man can tame his tongue. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. By way of illustration, they uh, sometimes talk about a horse that can't be broke. If he can't be broke, you can't fully trust him, can you? Psalms 32, verse 9. Do not be like a horse or like a mule, which has no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Psalms 32, verse 9. Even the most mature among us have to work at bridling our tongue and taming what we say. But it is never fully tamed. And we will give an account of every word according to Matthew 12 verses 36 through 37. The Lord's going to require it of us. We account for every word that we have to say. But I say unto you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. See how important they are? Particularly when we're dealing with our brethren as well as the world. You know, we are easily guilty of what we say is true of other people. It's easy for us to follow in their steps instead of in the steps of the Lord. We need to realize that we can sin with our tongue. Paul tells us to uh, fill in the blanks in Romans 1 verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, Deceit and evil mindedness. He says they are whisperers. Those people who do these things. They're whisperers. Romans 1 verse 29. Paul tells us in Galatians 5 verse 20. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, self-ambitious, dissensions and heresies. All of these things are dangers of the tongue. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 20. 
For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, backbiting, whispering, conceits, tumults. In other words, the church is all stored up, stirred up. Paul says he didn't want to see us that way. He does not want that to happen. But yet, if it does, he will take corrective action and they won't be happy to see him. Well, we know what it can do. It can cause you to sin against a brother. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. It can also cause you to slander other people. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. For he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? You know, if we have to judge someone, we need to do so with righteous judgment. Not with slander. Not with sinning against our brother. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips. And whoever spreads slander is a fool. According to Proverbs 10, verse 18. You know, Peter said that we should be the holy people and we should act like Christians. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy and envy, and all evil speaking. That's what he tells us in 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Accusing falsely. You know, that means giving to finding fault with the demeanor and conduct of other people. And spreading their innuendos and criticism in the church. This is Vine's definition of what we're talking about here. Slander of what happens uh, and can happen in the church itself. Being a gossip and being a busybody. 1 Timothy 5 verse 13 tells us that's not a good thing for Christians. And besides they learn to be idle. Wandering about from house to house and not only idle but also gossips and busybodies. Saying things which they ought not. 1 Timothy 5 verse 13. To um, be working around about instead of tending to one's own business is what Vine is talking about when we're talking about being idle. To be meddling and bustling about in other people's business. Busybodies. Idle workers. Those who gossip. Some who are not busied with their own business, but are busied in that of other people. And Vine gave us a pretty good description there of what it is that uh, we should not be doing. Backbiting is also another real problem. Romans 1 verse 30, backbiters, that's the first one. Haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. And disobedient to parents. These are things that are condemned for us as Christians. You know, the north wind brings forth rain. And a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. Proverbs 25 verse 23. You know, you see somebody who's angry all the time. He's probably a real strong backbiter. Because it brings forth angry countenance. So... Who shall dwell in the Holy Land? Psalms 15, verse 3. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up reproach against his friend. You want to be in the Holy Land? Don't do those things or you will not be there. Well, what effect can it have if I do? Well, it can destroy your neighbor. Proverbs 11, verse 9. 
As righteousness leads to life, so is he who pursues evil to his own death. You want to live? Practice righteousness. If you want to die, go ahead and practice evil. It reveals secrets when you backbite and gossip. Tell things that you shouldn't be telling. A talebearer reveals secrets. But he who is afraid, who, he who is a faithful spirit, conceals a matter. Proverbs 11, verse 3. He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. Proverbs 20, verse 19. You know, when you do these things, you're sowing strife. Proverbs 16, verse 28. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. Proverbs 16, verse 28. It'll also destroy the church. If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. It's kind of like a poison, you know. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison, James 3, verse 8. He also tells us in, in uh, verse 6 that a tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. A tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, and it sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. A tongue can be extremely damaging, just like a fire burning in a whole forest. It is a poison, it is a danger. Well, how do you prevent it from being a danger to you, to yourself, to other people around you? How can you prevent that? With restraint. What do we mean by restraint? Well, it's the act or operation of holding back or hindering from motion in any manner, hindrance of the will, or of any action, physical, mental, or moral. Holding back is restraining, abridgment of liberty, as the restraint of a man by imprisonment or by duress. Prohibition. The commands of God should be effectual restraint upon our evil passion. Limitations, restrictions, that which restrains, hinders, or represses the laws or restraints upon injustice. There are many ways to describe restraint, but what it is is we need to restrain our tongue. Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 15, verse 7 tells us, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. Proverbs 16, verse 23, the heart is a wise tongue. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. We have many other things that we can be doing with our mouth besides running other people down. Proverbs 17, verses 27 through 28. He who has knowledge spares his words. A man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Proverbs 17, verse 27 and 28. You know, you don't have to say all you want to say at any one time. You can get an opportunity, get your point across later on if necessary. But you don't have to blow up and say everything you want to say in one fatal swoop. Because there will be more time later on to do what you want to do when you think you have something that has to be said. Be careful with what you say to and about other people. 
restraint and being careful with what you say. You know, you may tell somebody something that's confidential, something that people did not want known, but yet when you open your mouth, you've let the cat out of the bag, as they say. What you say could be taken differently than what you actually intended for it to be. You need to make sure that your statements are clear because people will twist your words given the opportunity. Proverbs 11 verse 13 says, Be a faithful spirit. A talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is a faithful spirit conceals the matter. We are to be faithful Christians and faithful spirits. Proverbs 29 verse, verse 11 says, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Proverbs 11, verse 29. Looking at James 1, verse 19. Brethren, if any one of you want, among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, he saved a multitude of sins there. You know, what you say will be repeated by somebody somewhere and you will be quoted for what you say right or wrong you need to bear in mind and be careful what you say when you open your mouth be careful how you choose your words you want to make sure that you convey what you wanted to say not just what you think they would understand how are you going to do that? Well, listen to the wisdom of God. God tells us in the scripture what to do. Use tact. Proverbs 15 verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Sometimes you don't even need that harsh word to get anger stirred up. Think before you speak. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Many, many words come out of an evil person's mouth. Because they don't think about what they're saying. There's one who speaks like the piercing of a sword. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. It's good for you when they speak wisely. It is not good for you when they pour forth hatred from their mouth. You need to also watch the timing. A man has joy by the manner of his mouth, by the answer of his mouth. A word spoken in due season, how good it is. Proverbs 15 verse 23. Sometimes when we need comfort and consideration and consoling, a word well spoken will do it. Just like a word spoken in anger can tear you up. Watch the timing of your wording. Be careful what you repeat. There's two sides to every story. Your side and their side. Proverbs 18 verse 70. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. If you only hear one side of the story, you've only got half of it. What's the other side? Well, don't jump to conclusions. That's what it tells us in Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. To go out and spout one side and not spout the other. It's folly and shame for you to take one side and not know what the other one is. We also need to be able to give the benefit of the doubt to people when things happen. But it must mean that in regard to the conduct of others, there is a disposition to put the best construction upon it, to believe that they may be actuated by good motives and that they intend no injury and there is a willingness to suppose as far as can be 
that what is done is done consistently with friendship, with good feeling, and with virtue. That's Barnes' interpretation of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. And Clark says, It is ever ready to believe the best of every person and will credit no evil of any, but on the most positive of evidence. Don't ever put anybody down without evidence to prove it, is what Clark is trying to say here. Always give people the benefit of the doubt. Every person. Of course, there are some people that you know will lie to your face on every opportunity that they get. Even when the truth would serve them better, they will still tell you a lie. Proverbs 14, verse 15. The simple believe every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Proverbs 14, verse 15. So ask yourself, do you have any evidence of what you're talking about? Is there any other explanation that will serve the purpose of what you're doing? Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame to him. In Proverbs 29, verse 20, warns us against hasty words. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. We need to know the whole story before we open our mouth and condemn other people. Every one of us can work harder at being careful about what we say, how we say it, and to whom we say it. All of these things are very important so that we do not sin with our tongues. The Lord said the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and that we also need to repent of all of our sins and profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he was raised from the dead and he has defeated Satan in that attempt to cause all people to go to hell. We need to be immersed, immersed in water, have our sins washed away according to Acts 22.16 and uh, Acts 2.38. We need to live a faithful life until the Lord comes for us. Revelation 2.10, if we want that crown of life, we're going to have to remain faithful to Him. Those of us who are already Christians, if we err, we need to repent of our sins and pray to God that we have that forgiveness that He promises us. We'll let you know the invitation is yours while we stand and sing.